Let's visit countries across the globe to see some of their unique and some amazing medical technologies. Let's get started. Be woo. Dao Liao, or knife therapy, started 2,500 knife years therapy? ago in ancient China as an alternative method to traditional medicine. <laughs> no way, are they chopping people up? Yeah. No, not literally. It's just a massage with knives? Oh. Okay. Angelina Zhao has been practicing and teaching knife therapy for 14 years. Like knife therapist or secret assassin? System of oxygen flow. I mean, putting any kind of pressure in that kind of rapid succession, almost like percussive therapy you do with a the Theragun, will increase a little bit of circulation, superficially at least, and that will increase increase oxygen delivery to the cells. But you don't need a knife to do that. It is a customary practice to hover the knives over burning sandalwood and store them next to meteorites to maintain the knives light. <laughs> Sorry, the meteorites thing got me. <laughs> Everything else, I'm like, all right, they warm up the knife, it's dull, so it's a little safer, like I'm with it. And then they hit me with the meteorite. I just, I like, couldn't, the meteorite, man. And look, I don't mean to laugh, people have culture. Like, I'm just looking at this strictly from a medical lens. Will the meteorite change? <laughs> Thing in the knife, I can't. Especially when you're doing it through a blanket. I mean, I don't know, man. This must have some kind of cultural significance that I'm missing, but medically, I'm the meteorite thing got me. Yeah, my name is Justin Schmidt. He's an entomologist. Does that mean he studies bugs? He's been stung by a lot of insects. That's such an uncomfortable sensation. The fact that he's cool with it, I mean, I don't know that he's cool with it. He reviews insect stings the way a sommelier reviews wine. Pure, intense, brilliant pain like walking over flaming charcoal with a three-inch nail. Who's the audience for this book? If I was dating someone and I walked into their home and they had that book on their counter, I'd be concerned. Just saying. The Schmidt pain scale is basically a scale to rate the painfulness of stinging insects. What's the difference of just saying zero to 10? A one would be a sweat bee. Two would be something like a yellow jacket wasp. The three would be something like a harvest strand. And a four would be a tarantula hawk. What is a tarantula hawk? If I wake up tonight, there's a tarantula hawk on me in New York City. I swear to God, there's gonna be no YouTube videos for at least two weeks. It's an open secret in India that fair skin is seen as the beauty ideal, but skin color bias permeates all layers of society here. And it's causing some women to go to extreme lengths to become lighter. What's a black doll treatment? What I'm doing is I'm hitting all these carbon particles with the laser. So what it does, it will go and hit the melanin. When the hit, melanin is hit, it will get destroyed. We do use this treatment for melasma. It's also known as the mask of pregnancy, but this type of discoloration on the skin can occur with a lot of different situations. Certain medications, thyroid disease, sun exposure, tanning beds. How popular has this treatment been? From last year, there's a 100% increase in the number of people who are coming in for this treatment. You know what's interesting? I see the cultural shifts with these. I remember when I was younger, there were treatments for freckles to help freckles disappear. And now there's like freckle filters on Instagram and Snapchat that people are trying to put freckles on their body. So anytime you approach anything on your body, changing on your body, just, I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you with good certainty that you should weigh the pros and cons very, very seriously and almost give yourself some time before you ultimately make that decision. Bonobo apes are among our closest living relatives. They know which plants have healing properties. And here you see an end, exactly the way the bonobos would use it. What does that tell us? high up, so I can take off my mask for a moment. Wait, why does she need to have a mask on? Early in it, they said the bonobos are like subject to illnesses that the humans can bring in. So they try to mask up when they're out in the jungle. Oh, interesting. Humans in the region use this plant for medicinal purposes. They use the juice of the young leaves to treat wounds and eat them to treat intestinal cramps and diarrhea. People crush these leaves and apply them anally as enemas to treat wounds in the intestinal tract. What kind of wounds do you have in your lower intestinal tract? Like diverticulosis where there's an infection, but usually you need antibiotics for that, sometimes even IV antibiotics. Because diverticulitis is like a serious potentially hospitalizing condition. This file of medicinal plants demonstrates how challenging it is to obtain approval for new drugs in Western countries. It is hard and it should be hard because we shouldn't just take drugs willy nilly hoping that they work without any knowledge of who they work for, who they're safe for, are they better than current treatment? So there should be a roadblock, but it should be reasonable. This was a US company from California who tried to investigate medicinal plants in a fair way. This herbarium took 10 years and it's a trove 
trove of information. Then they went bankrupt because the U.S. authorities require so much documentation. Well, the U.S. authorities require documentation because we want proof. And I agree there's a lot of red tape and all this stuff, bureaucracy, but like, if you have sufficient evidence, it's going to get approved. I do wonder if it's some kind of intestinal pill. Maybe they eat it like that so the substances pass into the intestinal tract before they're digested by the stomach acids. Or they're primates and they just eat them because it's fun and they like it. Don't you want to know which one of those two it is before you start taking it for intestinal infections? This is a leech. For thousands of years, they were used to treat everything from skin diseases to fevers. Those cures almost certainly did more harm than good. <laughs> Balancing the humors they did to George Washington, RIP. But in the right hands, the leech can be a useful surgical assistant. Well, I'm pretty sure leeches apply some kind of chemical that actually prevents blood from clotting, which is how they're able to keep drinking your blood. And I believe that could be useful in some indications. I'm I'm actually, sure. I can feel it, yeah. Yeah. You definitely feel something going on there. <laughs> this is so creepy. At the moment, it's attached uh, by its head end where, where the jaws and teeth mm. will have made a hole. Here, you can see how the... Ew. <laughs> I did not need to see that. By helping blood to flow freely into newly reattached tissues, the leech can save parts of the body that would otherwise die. Wow. I had no idea that that was being used. The idea is that you've got to give someone who's been through a severe trauma an opportunity to heal. Speaking of trauma. <laughs> we have 40 animals at this facility. Wow, looks like Roxy. I think for all the veterans that we bring out here, whether they work here or they're here for a support group, what rings true is if they can heal, I can heal. You know, nature healing programs are real. It allows you to recenter in another way of living. And especially being around animals, whether it's equine therapy or being with wolves, just seeing how another type of species lives, seeing that they're also alive, that they have their own ways of living, kind of takes you outside of your own problems and allows you to see the bigger picture. What happens is one animal picks that one veteran. Never again does that animal pick someone else. Never wow. again does that animal want to show the same kind of affection to someone else. It's, it's got some deeper meaning when they accept you. They accept you into the family, part of the pack. That's really cool. Um, I'm hoping that they take uh, good care of their veterans and also safety precautions, because wolves at the end of the day, even if they're somewhat domesticated, they're still wild animals. All of a sudden you start to bleed. You know? large section of you is damaged, there's bleeding that's occurring, a blood vessel's broken. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a material that you could literally squirt onto that broken blood vessel and seal it up? Do you spray it on the blood vessel from the outside of the body or do you have to like surgically open the body and apply it directly to the blood vessel and it's bleeding? I'm assuming it's not like tire sealant where you just spray it anywhere in the blood vessels and then it finds its way to the, to the hole. The natural elastic protein is methacrylated. Methacrylated wow. tropolastins, we call it METRO for short. Let's look at the I following example. When a human lung is punctured, it collapses and requires surgery. METRO will eliminate the need for stitching or staples and will simplify wow. the procedure. Well, I understand that, but the average person in that car accident is not going to open their chest and find where their lung is, has a hole in it. So this would be strictly for doctor's use, I presume. Our METRO seals in seconds. It's stronger than surrounding lung tissue and it retains the lung's natural elasticity. That's interesting because that natural elasticity is what is the problem in many instances when it comes to using dermal adhesive or, or like skin glue. Because like, for example, if I have a cut on one of my patients over their joint, I don't like using skin glue because of its lack of elasticity causes it to open. But if you do the correct sutures, you could actually get better outcomes and maintain some of that elasticity, especially given the fact that the skin heals well, but dermal adhesives are really powerful and they're growing. Some of them inhibit bacterial growth, some have it repair tissues in much faster time, and there's less time spent going to take out sutures and stuff, not on lungs obviously, but on the superficial outside portion of the body. Cindy Kennedy suffers from diabetes. Four months ago, she had an abscess taken from her abdomen that left a gaping wound. The solution? Place hundreds of live maggots into the wound. Wow. The secret lies in their eating habits. These maggots eat only dead flesh. 
and leave healthy tissue alone. They not only eat dead flesh and leave healthy tissue alone, they can't multiply. And they also disinfect areas because when they digest the dead flesh, they actually digest the bacteria and make it non-infectious. The maggots are a kind of a cleaning device uh, for these wounds. Not only do they remove the dead tissue, which uh, removes the food source for the bacteria, then their saliva has uh, antibacterial effects. It's important to note that this doesn't work for all wounds, specifically dry wounds don't work well for these maggots. But to Cindy, the thought of maggots feasting on her body doesn't necessarily sound appetizing. Yeah, it doesn't sound appetizing, but usually patients don't turn this down because it does work well. And there are some bandages that you could apply that actually keep them from sight. A lot of these areas are really a lot, lot cleaner. The tissue that I can see in there is all pink. Yeah, we want that live tissue to be forefront because dead tissue can be a source of infection. When people go to a wound care center, a lot of times what they're doing is just debriding the tissue and cleaning out the dead tissue. So it looks like it's even painful and sometimes the bleeding occurs. You could even put topical chemicals on it that can uh, melt away some of that dead tissue. But maggots is definitely an optimal choice here. My name is Dr. Ashok Sukhmal Aswani. And I really like Charlie Chaplin. Okay, this is so random. Charlie Chaplin's first movie I saw was Gold Rush. I've never watched a Charlie Chaplin video. Dr. Aswani practices herbal medicine in his village and uses Charlie Chaplin to help treat his patients. Does he run a medical center and a Charlie Chaplin blockbuster all in one? DVD me, Charlie Chaplin. Did he get those? Looks like he burned those illegally. <laughs> I feel like a DMCA copyright strike is coming his way. Would you recommend any films or television shows to your patients? No, for laughter, because it's so individually dependent. The only type of recommendation of media that I give outside of my YouTube videos, just kidding, is bibliotherapy. When I recommend specific books for patients that have specific problems, that can be a source of entertainment, but also educational value for what they're going through. My name is... Paul Alexander. Is this guy in an iron lung right now? But they call me the man in the iron lung. Paul spends almost every moment of his day in an iron lung, which is the only thing that's keeping him alive. Why is he still in an iron lung? We have modern medical equipment that would work probably more efficiently than an iron lung. That's because he's paralyzed from the neck down, so without it, he can't breathe. The machine helps him breathe by using negative pressure to take air into his lungs. Okay, that's a good thing to explain right here. When we take a deep breath in, a lot of people think we kind of have some sort of magical control to just pull air in. But all that's happening, mechanically speaking, is the muscles surrounding our lungs, the diaphragm, the rib muscles, the intercostal muscles, they open, so that pulls the lungs apart. And when you create that negative pressure by pulling apart, it naturally sucks air in into the lungs. The opposite happens when you exhale. So all you're doing is controlling muscles. The machine itself is not an iron lung. You're the lung inside the body. So the big iron thing is the body and it starts pulling with its muscles and you essentially function as the lung, even though the lung is inside of you. Well, I started feeling like, you know, when I went inside to get mom and she turned and looked at me and she said, oh my God, not my son. Over the next five days, I lost everything. The ability to move. That's the poliomyelitis. My legs hold me up, and then I couldn't breathe. You know what we have to realize? That since the inception of the polio vaccine, maybe not exactly since the inception because it took a while for people to get on board, but since like the late 70s, early 80s, there have been no outbreaks because of the polio vaccine. Talk about efficacy. Polio only exists right now somewhere in the Middle East. Like there's no natural cases of it here in the US. I wanted to be a lawyer for a long time. After years of hard work, Paul passed the bar and became wow. a lawyer. You could do like Zoom sessions with him. With the help of a pen attached to a stick, Paul wrote his own biography entirely with his mouth. These days with technology and like eye tracking software, he might be able to write so much quicker with probably less stress uh, on the muscles of his face. Or past, or even disability, does not have to define your future. It's a great example of post-traumatic growth, where through trauma, you grow as a human, you come out more focused, more revitalized, wanting to spread a meaningful message to others. A doctor from the UK and I have had beef on YouTube. We settle it here on this episode of the Checkup Podcast. Click here to check that out, and as always, stay happy and healthy.